Marketing Science TV. This is episode two. Today we'll be talking to 2014 Commonwealth gold medalist and light middleweight prospect Anthony Fowler and how he's transitioned from the amateur game to the professional ranks with Boxing Science. We're also going to be discussing the topic of the week, youth training and how it's important for uh, young athletes development in boxing. Our exercise of the week are the use of mini bands, you know, side clams, crab walks, and why we use mini bands in boxing specific actions. And of course, I'll be answering your questions that you've been firing in this week on Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Hello, and welcome to uh, the second episode of Boxing Science TV. Uh, this week's been busy at uh, Boxing Science. Uh, we've had the group sessions that you know we're pushing the lads hard on 30 second maximal sprints, um, which I'm not getting thanked for a lot. As you can see in the footage that you're just watching now, uh, it's pretty tough. Pretty tough. We're pushing their body to the max. Um, you know they've got to hit maximal intensity straight away and trying to endure that. Uh, we'll do around about four reps. You know, they're trying to hit maximal intensity, the very top speed. You know, we've got data from their previous uh, training camps, and you know, we're, we're giving them targets every time. Um, you know, they, they are not hitting them targets at the moment, but that's expected. But they're finding it hard trying to hit that. But that means that we're going to get the maximal out of them using that data from previous camps, from previous bets will help them push through these early stages of camp where they're not going to feel too good. Uh, so yeah, that's why the 30 second max uh, runs are, are really hard and for those that are just starting, uh, it's, it's even harder because it's hitting them like a ton of bricks because they're not used to this type of training, everything's done in reverse. You know, they're used to doing three minutes long intervals with shorter rests, now they're doing shorter intervals with them with a much longer rest but really hitting that intensely so they'll get fit really quick through this method and also we've had Anthony Fowler training hard he's seven weeks out from his homecoming fight in Liverpool and we managed to have a little bit more structured chat to him to find out how boxing science has helped him transition from the amateur to professional ranks of course there's different um, different pacing strategies and um, for different kinds of punches that he's got to throw so he's been working hard technically uh, but physically it's demanding him as well especially because he's dropped down a weight division um, he was weighing in at 75 kilos uh, middleweight division in the amateurs and now he's down a light middleweight 70 kilos so you know getting used to uh, doing the weighing doing the weight cut making sure that he's maintaining muscle mass and stripping his body fat down and maintaining strength as he comes down has been a really important factor in what we've been focusing on as well. So we had a little bit of more structured chat around how boxing signs have helped him and how his training is going towards his fight on September 30th. Okay, so I'm here with Anthony Fowler. Anthony, how are you doing? Good, I feel great. Good last whole session there, so feeling good. Good stuff, so can you just explain what you've just been doing? In today's session I've done some weight, strength work, low reps, high weight and um, I've just finished off with some interval work on the curve. Yeah, so you're looking, uh, looking a bit sweaty there. It's, no, it's not an easy joke mate, I got work very hard by Annie Wilson, so it's, yeah. it's good training. Good stuff, so you've been on the Boxing Science programme for, well, this is your second camp, you've been on it for seven weeks, you've had two fights uh, and then you've just training for a date in September 30th. Yeah. So, how's the training been so far? Obviously, you've been with Team GB uh, for seven years, eight years. Yeah. You know, you've done a lot of strength conditioning at a world-class level already. How's the transition been to, to working with Boxing Science? Yeah, with GB, it was very much a team effort. We'd all work together, whereas with Boxing Science and training like a champion program, it's individually for me. So it's all about me and my goals. Every week we're getting more into them. Not just monitoring my strength levels, my body fat, my muscle mass. So with boxing science, I'm keeping all my strength, all my muscle mass, burning fat and keeping all my strength and I do feel stronger than ever. Fantastic. What's your favourite part of training so far? 
and um, I, I, I do enjoy it all, even though it's all tough. I don't like the curve, I can't deny that, but yeah. I realised I'm getting results, so I enjoy doing it because I know that come fight night, I'm going to be fitter, stronger, and more conditioned than my opponents. So, strength and conditioning, pretty important for boxers today. It's very important, the future is strength and conditioning. Mm. Every year, every so often, athletes are getting stronger and fitter, that's down to strength and conditioning. But we're all stronger human beings now, and with the advanced boxing science, gives me that little edge mm. over my opponents. So, as I go up the rankings, the lads who are as lucky to have, I'm going to program the other struggle in the later rounds. Definitely, and one of the key things about strength and conditioning and nutrition is that people are getting bigger for the weight and you've come down to like middle weight. Mm. Uh, amateur, you were boxing at 75, yeah. coming down to 70 kilos now, uh, light middle weight. How do you feel that change, you know, boxing at a lighter weight uh, and keeping that strength as well? Yeah, well, Danny Wilson's monitored all my, all my muscle mass, all my fat levels and we've noticed that I've brought my fat down, I've kept all my muscle, which is the key thing for me because yeah. I didn't want to go down the weight and lose my strength, but I've lost body fat. I lose a bit of fluid for the way in, but I keep all my strength and I'm boxing smaller men. So mm. both my opponents have both been smaller and both ways, width and height smaller than me. So I'm getting the ring a big, massive, strong, like middle weight and mm. full of power. Yeah, like I say, uh, two fights in. How's uh, professional boxing treating you so far? It's going well. I've got two fights, two knockouts. My first fight was over and around, so I didn't show much. But my second fight, I had a poem with a winning record. He had a high knockout ratio. And he comes to win, and I showed me skills. I, showed, I didn't just blast them out, I broke them down, and I showed that I'm not just a brawler, I can box. Yeah, so you're under professional trainer now, Dave Caldwell. Uh, you're learning a lot from him. Yeah, Dave's a brilliant coach, he knows the game inside and out, so I'm very lucky for the team I've got. I do believe I've got one of the best teams in the world. That's not even being cocky about a brain boxing coach, a brain strength condition. I've got all the little, little tools in there, but the two main things are me boxing and my strength conditioning and I'm very big, very fit, very strong and my technique's improving under Dave so I will be a force this week. Exactly, so Dave's based in Rotherham, we're based in Sheffield and you're from Liverpool so what kind of strain does it have being away from home? Being away from home is tough but I've moved away to Sheffield for the reason that mm. my best team, I'm saying I've got the best coach, best strength condition in the country so I moved away because there's no distractions down here. Us I see is I see Dave, I see Danny, I go home and I sleep. So my life is very, I live like a monk. So I don't yeah. see any friends, it's very tough, but I'm being my own, it can be mentally tough, but yeah. I believe that it makes me a stronger athlete and very more mentally tough. Yeah, a lot of people just see you under the bright lights and in the press conferences yeah. and everything like that. They don't see what you've got to go through so I think maybe we'll every day. Me, Danny Wilson and Dave Cole both see me day in, day out, putting the grafting and it's no fluke, I've got what I am, a few hard work, but it hasn't happened overnight. Yeah, it's great. So, next fight coming up, September 30th, back in the hometown of Liverpool. Are you excited yeah, for that? Brave, mate. It's going to be amazing. At the atmosphere, I can't wait to see it. And all my friends and family there, and all the fellow scouts who just support me because I am a scout, set. it's going to be amazing. Yeah, so you've got high motivation levels at the minute. What's your motivation for the next year? What does it Next 12 months spring for Anthony Fowler. I want to prove myself as the best let me weight in the country first. I want to win the Commonwealth, the British titles, and then once I've conquered Britain, we move on to the world. Yes, sir. Nice one, it's great man. listening to Anthony there, um, finding out you know, what, he, what he really thinks about the programme and, and what's important to him too. And I think that's vital for a coach to know, you know that's the things that your athlete wants to hear. Um, you know, Ante is a top athlete, he you know, he listens, he takes everything on board and he gives you hundred percent effort. So I'm really excited to see, you know, his next fight. Now we've got like ten a full ten week camp with him and uh, see where he is in about a year's time. I'm sure that he'll be challenging and winning some domestic titles. And that brings us on to the topic of the week, which is youth training. Now, this is a really, really big subject, and it can't be covered in just one uh, vlog episode. So, I'm just going to touch on what I think uh, is important in, in youth training, uh, wh which is a key area. Now, there's so many benefits added to uh, resistance and, and physical training whilst being a youth, um, you know, 
there's going to be accelerated adaptations in strength, speed, fitness, coordination, agility, all of them really important. It's important that there's a focused uh, training program, so technical development and physical development go hand in hand. Uh, there's a real kind of window of, of opportunity where between uh, being a child and adolescent and going on to being 17, 18 years old and the key thing for me is that we're preparing them for more advanced training in the future. When I've worked with championship level boxers that have never done strength and conditioning before, uh, they can't move, they're, you know, they're really limited in the movement, uh, the, the strength levels aren't great and they've got a fight in seven to ten weeks time and it's my job to try and get them strong um, because they haven't done that physical development as a child, as a youth or in the early stages of their career so it really limits them to what they can do. Now if we have a boxer and we've got many boxers that are in the early stages of their career they've gone through them stages already so when they at a world title or European or British title level, bang, they're going to be training uh, at that world level straight away and being able to really improve on the strength, really improve on the speed and the fitness with more advanced training methods. So trying to get youth athletes started with strength conditioning and movement training as early as you can is really important to prepare them for future training. But the main reason why I think that youth training is really important is to try and prevent injury. Well, I say prevent, I mean reduce injury. Injuries do happen, but if we can put in different training methods to help reduce the likelihood of that, uh, it's going to be much better for our athlete. Like I said, the stages between ages 11, 17, uh, where you want your athlete, your young athlete, to be making the most adaptation, the most development, and that's where they're going to be learning technically, tactically, and be developing physically as well. If they're injured and they're out, it could either put them off from training, uh, or put them off from the sport altogether. Uh, it can end up stagnating their uh, progression. So making sure that our athletes, or uh, our young athletes, are um, are injury free, the more that they can train, the more they can learn, the more that they can develop. Now why are injuries going to be so common in youth athletes? Well between the ages of 13 to 16 they can go through a massive growth spurt and within this growth spurt uh, to keep a long story short is basically the limbs can grow quite long in a short amount of time. This means that movement patterns and, and the muscle groups take the time to kind of adapt to these longer limbs and this can affect muscular imbalances, muscular tightness, uh, movement patterns like I just mentioned. You know, and this can increase the strain on, um, on muscles and tendons and ligaments and it could be likely that there's some injuries. Um, you know, the most common being uh, lower back injuries that I've, I've seen um, where an athlete's got taller in a short amount of time and the hamstrings are really really tight and the, their lower back go. and who wants their young athlete to be injured and out of practice now this is a time for their adaptations and their skill levels to accelerate not to be halted and to, for them to be put off by training or competing as well so it's really important that we do the right training at the right time to try and avoid these situations. And recent testing that I've done with youth athletes in boxing at a quite a high level, their mobility is pretty poor. So something needs to change. Now I'm not going to say, right, we just need to do loads of stretching and flexibility work because that's just focusing on, on one area. We can kill two birds with one stone or, or many birds one stone by focusing on the like the key area of strength conditioning for young athletes which is developing motor skills. Youth and adolescent athletes have a critical time period where they have high sensitivity to some neuromuscular training and some movement training as well. 
So it's obviously a time to develop skill, but it's also a good time to develop foundational movement patterns to get them prepared for more advanced training methods in the future. So learning how to squat, how to uh, press, how to pull, how to lunge and twist and hop and hold and everything like that, it's going to be really important to help improve motor skills, help improve flexibility and mobility, to improve core strength, reduce injury and help prepare for more advanced training methods in the future. Now if you're a boxing coach watching this and you're a little bit wary about you know, using strength training, using weights to help get your athlete stronger and fitter, you know, you don't need to go and do that straight away because we'll be covering this in a few episodes time. So if you're a boxing coach and you're watching this and you want to start integrating some of this stuff into your training with your young athletes but you're still a little bit wary about using strength training and using weights to develop your young boxers in the gym, don't worry because we're going to be covering this in a few episodes time and there are a few quick wins that you can have to try and improve your boxers movement. I'm going to set you a challenge. I want you to do four exercises to help improve mobility, flexibility, stability and movement patterns every session for the next four or five weeks. Before I want you to do an overhead squat which I'm just going to show you how to do in a second. Take a photo of that. Then I want you to commit to four exercises before each boxing session. Then take a photo after and see how much you've improved. Okay, so a good uh, squat regression exercise is overhead squat. Uh, if you master this technique, it makes all the other squats uh, easier. It's really good for hip mobility and shoulder mobility. So Rizal's just going to uh, demonstrate the overhead squat. So his feet are going to be shoulder width apart. He's going to hold a broomstick above the head. He's going to lock out his elbows so his arms are nice and straight. And um, the bar is going to be on line with the crown of your head. Okay, and it's just going to descend, just like a normal squat. Pushing your hips back, pushing your knees out, holding the broomstick on line with the head. Making sure there's a slight forward lean of the upper body, but not excessive. Nice controlled tempo, sitting back onto the heels and making sure that the bar stays over the crown of your head all the way through the movement. Okay. The first exercise I want you to use are eagles. Complex exercise but really effective for shoulder mobility, thoracic rotation and core mobility as well. The next exercise are glute bridges to activate the glutes, improve hip mobility, stability and help improve core strength. Now there's a really good way to try and get the most out of this exercise and that's popping a foam roller between the legs, squeezing the foam roller as hard as you can. Now this basically switches off the overactive adductors when extending the hips. Do this for around about 10 seconds, take the foam roller out, continue with the glute bridges and you get much more out of the workout. Then we're going to get up onto our feet and use lateral lunges. You're going to find it quite difficult to start off with, so using something in front of you, pushing out your hands, uh, using, I'm using a foam roller with uh, Kid Gallard here and basically pushing it out will help counterbalance, get a little bit deeper into that lap. So the overhead squat is a really good mobility exercise. Um, some boxers might find it difficult because of the tightness in the hips or the shoulders. So what we can use to help improve the movement is use a box. So a little uh, wooden box over here, Vizard. I just want you to do an overhead box squat. So just sitting down onto the box, back up, this allows you to get a better, um, better position at the bottom of the squat. So all that footage that you've just watched is yours. You can watch that whenever you want. But if you're wanting to watch a little bit more, you can get the Boxing Science Starter Pack for just £5, where you get the footage of Kid Gala doing a training session with my commentary explaining why we're doing certain things and how you can adapt it into your gym. Also the coaching videos, also full movement training programs. So if you're wanting to extend from them four exercises that I've just given you, you've got a full training program there that you can use in your gym. And also we've got the Kickstart Your Conditioning webinar brought to you by Alan Ruddick where he's going to explain how to use the boxing science training methods within your training environment. 
So this is just five pounds. It's well worth the investment and it's on the link below. Now this brings us on to our exercise of the week, which are mini bands. Mini bands are a great way to help develop the glute muscles, in particular the glute medius. Now the glute medius is a muscle just at the side of the hip, which can be quite underactive because um, the TFL and different muscles in the hip and the adductors are quite tight. So the glute medius gets a little bit neglected when it's really important for hip extension and rotation during a punch. And also it's important in improving hip stability and injury prevention as well. In particular in the lower back, um, in the hips and the knees as well. So we use mini bands mainly with two exercises, side clams and crab walks. And these are the exercises that I'm going to introduce now. These are really isolated exercises that can really focus on firing up the glute med. However, I still see a lot of people doing it wrong, either in the gym or on social media, when it's a really simple exercise to try and help activate the glute med. So I've got Jordan Gill doing some side clams. He's doing it right here. But what I can see a lot of people doing is not being able to keep the hip stable. That rotation of the hip, the external rotation of the hip is just activating TFL and not really working the glute meds as much. So if you see your athlete doing this, what I want you to do is just get behind them, making sure they're not rotating anywhere with the back or in the hips, and just make sure that it's just the knee that's moving out. To help try and get more activation through the glute med, I'd say not go full range of motion, just get uh, go between 20 and 80% of the movement up and down and that's really really working the glute med right there. Also crab walks, so having the band round your knee again, now you're going to be walking and extending your leg to the side. Jordan's doing it really well here, you can have his toes pointed forward a little bit more. Uh, concern is how he extends his leg. This is a common fault, what I see, athletes push out with their feet and this causes a knee valgus. This isn't doing anything for the glutes. So, you know, a lot of people are wasting the time doing these exercises but not thinking the little specific things to get the most out of it. So, instead of pushing out with feet, I encourage our boxers to push out with the knees. This means that their adductors aren't switched on, they're loose and we're getting more out of the glute med. So if you're a keen boxing science follower, you'll already know that we use the mini bands during shadow boxing action. A really good way to fire up the glutes in a boxing specific. There's only so much that we can do in improving glute strength if they don't know how to transfer it into their boxing punch. So it's a great way to transition the strength that they're getting from their key compound lifts to, uh, to punching action. Mini bands are also a great way to taper down for a fight. You know, we're adding slight overload to boxing specific action. The fast, the explosive, the hips feel great once we take the bands off. And we also use it for warming up. Now we use a slightly lighter band, so we're not fatiguing the glutes too much. And this is a great way to get all them lower body muscles fired up before they go and hit the pads. You can see Callum here is, is being nice explosive. The bands aren't restricting his movement that much. Just having that slight overload, so when he's on the pads, he's ready to go and he can get fired up, ready for competition. Not only does it have great benefits uh, physically, it also has great benefits technically too. When working with Callum Beardo um, during his rehab, when he had shoulder injuries, he was um, having uh, some problems with his hip. Now doing loads of things in the gym for him, but I wanted to see what were happening Boxing wise. In this footage here, we do ban a banded shadow box, we do shadow box normal. As you can see, just on this still here, look at the knee valgus on the left hand side, yeah, in his right leg. This is what's causing his hip pain. He's, just, he's not really getting much rotation from his hips, not much glute uh, activation. Everything's coming from his adductors and his hamstrings. 
put the bands on, his, his knee stays out and he's getting much more from his hips. So we started using uh, mini bands from this moment, you know, as a warm up tool. And this has helped Callan, you know, get better rotation from his hips and his punches. But also, it's helped him, um, you know, it's helped eliminate them hip injuries for him. Okay, so it's time for me to answer your questions. Uh, I got a good question a little bit earlier on by Andras from Slovenia, uh, the, from the Golden Gloves gym uh, that I went to go and visit on my holidays. And he asked me, basically, what's the main difference between programming for amateur boxers and for professional boxers? And it is a question that I've been asked a few times, um, especially from a boxer that's like looking to um, use the Train Like Champion program and they're going to be fighting every three weeks, every four weeks, something like that. So they don't particularly have a 10 week program. Um, obviously it depends on the athlete and what training history they have. But I'll use the boxers on the Boxing Science program as a little bit of an example. So for professionals such as Kyle, Yousaf, uh, Barry Ward and Jordan Gill, Anthony Fowler, um, we use 10 week training blocks to help them prepare for competition because they need to peak for that competition and they'll only fight three, four times a year, um, you know, not four times in the space of, you know, last year we had the ABAs um, or the National League Championships and they box four times within a month. So then training is a little bit different. Um, of course, with professional boxers, they get the dates well in advance so we're able to put together a structured plan so they're peaking at that time now with amateur boxers you know they can get a fight date in two or three weeks notice um, they're going to be boxing quite often so in terms of peaking we get them to peak for their main competition um, they might have two peaks within a season so we look to try and use a general preparation block, strength, strength, speed, and work for a speed block up to that moment. So, for example, we have uh, last year with Callum, uh, our peaking phase was for um, him winning the English title belt, and then a little bit of a transition phase and maintaining speed up to that. Um, up to that national championships. When a fight, when a bout does come up for an amateur boxer, I look for like a, a little bit of a two week taper where they're basically the first first week of that taper is basically dropping uh, the amount of sets that they do, the amount of reps and the weight load as well. So they'll probably hit 80% of what they hit the week before. So if they were lifting 100 kilos, they'd now be lifting 80 kilos. Instead of five reps, I'll do three reps. And instead of five sets, I'll do four or three sets, something like that. Depending on how fit and how strong they are at that time. And obviously how important that competition is and what competition precedes that as well. Um, and then on the fight week, they'd lift weights really, really light on uh, at the start of the week. And then they won't touch weight towards the end of the week and they'll basically use mini bands and uh, boxing specific exercises within the session and they don't run as well. So, so yeah, so that's how I'd differ, um, amateurs and professionals. Basically, you've, you've got to just um, analyze individual situations, uh, but mainly with amateurs, plan a block to peak at certain points in the season and then uh, adapt your program to make sure that they're tapered um, for different bouts within the season. And for professionals, work to your 10 week blocks, but also have a long term vision in mind what's the next 10 week block going to have for the next fight, etc. etc. Next question comes from uh, our boxing science training group again, Matthias Moller from Germany, and he asks, Do you also use complex training methods? 
absolute strength paired with power, ballistic or punching exercises. And what are your re recommendations for complex training? So, yes, we do do like some sort of complex exercises. Um, don't really particularly do complex training. Um, the reason why I did my undergraduate dissertation in uh, post-activation potentiation, so using a heavy loaded exercise to excite the muscles, to get them fired up, to be more explosive through a speed or jumping exercise. And what I found was that it depends on the strength levels. So you've got to be really, really strong for that to work. And you need a lot of rest time. You need either four or six minutes total rest. Now you've got not only that, a short amount of time, but you've got contradictory training methods going on at the same time, uh, such as running, sparring, uh, pad work, everything like that, and really endurance-based stuff. So what I'd be looking to do complex training with is like kind of explosive sports, uh, rather than doing it with, with boxing. You know, that's a really specific training method. But what I would do is use them in, in the warm-up, which we do. Um, we pair loaded jumps, box jumps, kettlebell swings, um, sometimes clean pulls with something like a punching exercise. So landmine punch, landmine punch throw, medicine ball throw. Um, we do use them to like kind of um, get the get the boxer fi fired up and uh, being being explosive just for an extra stimulus. I wouldn't say that it's strictly complex training. Okay, the next question is from Rubitko Gustina and he's asked his question through Instagram. Um, what are your exercises you do when it's at almost short time? Short time as in fighting and, uh, and boxing. So we use um, basically the exercises that they use. So we don't do anything that's uh, really, really complex. We do mobility exercises. Don't do many reps on this. Between six and eight reps, uh, we go through floor exercises, mobilize the shoulders, the hips, and fire up the glutes. Uh, we also do uh, some movement patterns, so squats, um, squats, lunges, lateral lunges. And then we do some sort of isometric kind of punch holds. So this is basically tensing up all the core, the glutes, the legs, the arms. We fire up the glutes through a banded shadow box, as we, as we just mentioned, uh, getting, getting ready for, to snap them punches in on the pads. Okay, I've got time for one last question. This is from Sean Reddles from Huddersfield, Yorkshire, but I'm a Sheffield Wednesday fan, so if you're a Huddersfield Town fan, I don't know whether we're getting on at the moment, but yeah, he's asked me, uh, what's the best monitoring exercises, tools and equipment uh, for tra uh, tracking progression in strength, power and cardio? Um, so we do uh, testing. Um, Try and do this every 10, 12 weeks, um, and there's a huge range of stuff that we use. But in terms of everyday stuff, uh, we obviously take down the weight loads, what they do, um, multiply this by sets and reps, and this creates a training load. So we know that they're progressing, and then we will basically drop the weight, drop the training load after three weeks and making sure they have deload weeks. In terms of power, we'll say speed and impulse. We use the gym aware, which tracks their speed during exercise and we can uh, monitor how they're performing at different weight loads. For conditioning, we use curve speed, we use training load, and we also uh, use heart rate. Heart rate's a big thing, so we can know that they're uh, working in the red zone and know when they've had a hard week for the internal physiological demands of the sport 
as uh, sparring. We don't want them spending too much time in the red zone, either in one session or in one week or in one day. So we use uh, heart rate uh, quite a lot. Okay, so that brings us to the end of episode two. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and keep up to date with uh, what's going on at Boxing Science. And also, if I have any questions in the week, I'll try and answer as many as I can. I put out a request earlier, I got asked about 20 questions, so if I haven't asked a question this week, I'll try and get through it in the week or do it in the next episode. If you could like this video and share it and spread the word Boxing Science because we're doing this to try and help benefit the boxing community, to make the best sport in the world even better. Cheers guys.